I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me and uh, just uh, uh, thank you all for coming to my talk at the very end of the, the conference. <laughs> so yes, um, so today I'll be talking to you about um, our software Hadrons, which is this, uh, this workflow management system for letter simulations, which of course I'll explain what that actually means. So um, in terms of lattice simulations, this is uh, sort of factorized into sort of the configura configuration generation, uh, measurement, and analysis steps. And so really what we're focusing on here is the uh, measurement process. So um, this is you, like almost exclusively um, built of sort of repeated operations repeated many times, such as um, inversions of the Dirac operator and contraction um, operations. Um, and so, uh, really, these are, these are the objects that are coming up all the time, and we really want to reduce the amount of sort of code du duplication and setup of these of these uh, these operations. Um, and really, we want to have the user focusing specifically on the physics of what they're doing and not writing the code. We want to have sort of an intuitive uh, uh, way to design these these uh, these applications. And so we're all very used to this sort of serial uh, functional programming approach where you just uh, have some objects and then you call a series of functions on them and then you have uh, some results. But uh, is this really sort of the, the most natural way to think about this, this, uh, this process? You have to uh, worry quite a lot about the creation of objects and uh, their lifetime and the memory that they use. So, uh, so the question really is, is there a better model for this? Uh, which is what Hadrons tries to... Um, tries to address. So uh, first, I'll just mention, uh, so Hadrons is, is based around uh, the software Grid. Um, so as many of you are probably aware, Grid is a sort of open source um, C++ library, which uh, supports a very highly scalable and cross-platform uh, lattice field theory uh, functionality. So uh, it supports a range of, uh, of technologies, and also uh, it has a single API to access all of these, and especially with the uh, backends of uh, CUDA, HIP, and SICL, for, uh, so we can use NVIDIA, uh, AMD, and Intel GPUs, so all the uh, GPUs from all the modern uh, large vendors. And uh, you can uh, go to this uh, GitHub if you'd uh, like to use it and uh, improve it. Um, and I won't go into lots of details about this, but. Uh, but uh, there is a, a nice uh, proceedings from uh, Azusa Yamaguchi um, a few years ago. And um, this talk isn't about uh, performance, but I thought I'd just quickly uh, flash, uh, flash one performance plot from Grid, um, which is showing uh, about essentially how we're um, at the Tursa Edinburgh system. Uh, it's sort of saturating, uh, how it saturates the uh, InfiniBand, um, the, uh, uh, InfiniBand communication as the local volume increases, but we're still seeing scaling of the uh, intranode communication with NVLink. Um, so the nice thing about Grid is it's a very high performance and multi-architecture um, system. So um, we write one code and we can port it to uh, more or less any system uh, in use today, at least. Um, and so it allows the user to like write the code to uh, get functionality. Um, you use the functionality to get into the physics, um, which, and it gives the user a huge amount of flexibility when writing this. Um, however, there are some downsides. The user has to care about every minute detail. So for example, here, you have to do lots of things like creating Cartesian grids, and it cares about the, uh, the SAMD layout and the uh, MPI. So these are things that we'd rather not have to, to worry about when designing, uh, designing an application that does say inversions, contractions, these kind of things. Um, and you often get uh, sort of long strings of just uh, operations like this where you are applying functions to, uh, to some inputs, and then you're creating various lattice-type objects. And it's, uh, yeah, so lots of just sort of applying functions linearly. Um, so to, uh, the idea uh, that we're trying to get around this with is with the software uh, Hadrons. So this is a, a workflow management system that goes on top of uh, the grid layer. Um, and it works through a, a data flow programming paradigm, which essentially is just um, 
trying to think about a program not by the linear steps, but by the way the data moves through the program. Um, um, and so you can see, uh, you can go to this uh, GitHub for, for more information, and also there is uh, the documentation and sort of getting started guide here. Um, and of course, this is all open source, uh, so you're welcome to use and contribute as you see fit. Um, we'd love to, to see your GitHub icon in the contributors list. Uh, along with all of the other default images. <laughs> so uh, what really is a workflow management system? So I have a screenshot here from everyone's favorite information source. Um, so we see here a workflow management system provides infrastructure for setup, performance, and monitoring of a defined sequence of tasks. So uh, as I've just already mentioned, uh, grid is, we're using grid to get the performance. Um, grid to get the performance. And Hadrons is here to handle the setup and monitoring steps of this, uh, of this approach. And so Hadrons does this by having uh, these things called modules, which are sort of an elementary piece of functionality. And you connect them in a graph structure like this. So uh, quickly here we have sort of a, we have a, a gauge module. Uh, we have some firm actions that rely on the gauge. We have some solvers that rely on the actions. Uh, some propagators that rely on the solvers and a source, and you see it gets connected into this, uh, this graph structure. And um, the idea being that this is a sort of more natural way, I would argue, to, uh, uh, to visualize a, a, a measurement code at least. Um, you don't have to care about when objects are created, when they're destroyed. All you care about is what functionality you need right now and what, uh, de what does it depend on. Um, okay. So um, there's also, uh, so once you have this, this graph structure, what, what happens to it? Of course, to actually run it, it needs to be serialized into uh, what we have called a schedule. Um, but this is something that um, the, the user doesn't necessarily have to worry about. Um, and part of the schedule is also uh, the management of object lifetimes. So there's a garbage collection that will automatically destroy objects as soon as there are no more dependencies relying on it. Um, and this minimizes the sort of peak memory that you, uh, uh, you hit in your job. Um, so first of all, there is this uh, thing called a naive scheduler, which is literally just it uses the schedule in the order that you uh, asked for. Um, so if you, as a user, have a, like, you know what is the optimal schedule, uh, then uh, it gives you that functionality. However, most powerfully is uh, you can have this uh, memory optimizer. So, um, the way it works is at the beginning of the job, it essentially uh, finds out how big each object is in each module, and it uh, uses a genetic algorithm to minimize the peak uh, memory usage by your job. Um, this is very important because uh, as you get to very large numbers of modules, uh, you can quickly run out of memory uh, on the host by storing so many propagators. So this can help to uh, get below that, uh, that threshold and actually allow your job to run. Um, so this uses a genetic algorithm, which I'll just briefly uh, outline. What it basically does is it produces an initial population of potential schedules. Um, it then scores them by some heuristic that you, need to op you want to optimize. So in our case, it's the, uh, the peak memory usage. Um, then you essentially prune, you remove the, uh, the worst scoring of these, and then you create the next generation by having sort of crossover and mutation operators that, uh, that change the schedules and give you your next generation. And then you repeat this uh, until either you have a, a sco sort of score that plateaus, so you found what, what is likely the optimum or close to it, or you just hit the maximum number of generations. Um, OK, so uh, it also uh, supports monitoring of the resources. So um, one of the most important resources is um, the memory, which uh, I'm talking about in the case of the schedule. So um, it automatically um, logs the, um, the CPU and, if you're using GPU, GPU memory usage into uh, a database, uh, an SQLite database, so a database in a file, um, which allows the user to easily visualize and search through this, this information. And so here's an example for, from one of my production jobs where you can see as it goes through the job, you can see sort of the, the steps, the memory, uh, 
We're doing sort of lots of inversions, increasing the, uh, the memory that's uh, um, in use. And then uh, as they're being consumed, they get automatically freed. And so the, the memory usage then goes down again. Um, and then here, of course, you have the, the peak memory uh, usage throughout the job, which this is the, the thing that the scheduler will optimize. Um, and of course, uh, for, you also see the, the GPU memory usage. Um, and I don't, quite, I don't have it on this plot, unfortunately, but you can also see the number of um, uh, times objects are moved on and off of the GPU, um, which can be very helpful for, um, sort of, um, for performance analysis of, um, of the code. Okay, and uh, every module is automatically wrapped in uh, lots of timers and, um, and things like this. And at the end, you get a, a very nice breakdown of exactly how long each module took. And you can quickly see at a glance what is taking up all of your time, what things need to be optimized. So for example, here, uh, we have 48% of the time is spent in each of these modules here. And these are just uh, Dirac operator inversions. And then everything else is taking sort of a negligible amount of time. Um, Okay, so, um, so one additional thing is um, the management of output files. So for large jobs, especially once they scale to, uh, to sort of large, um, large projects, you can get many, many files. You need to be able to manage them. Um, traditionally, this is done by just saving them into a folder structure, and the folder structure tells you what's in them. Um, but we think that... Uh, uh, this can make it very hard to find data, um, especially if it's, you're not the one who generated it. So instead, uh, Hadrons allows the user to um, log files that are output into uh, another SQLite database, where they, they, um, the person writing the application is uh, designing this, this database and the fields in it, in a, uh, so you can fill it in a sort of searchable way. So for example, here, this is just a Meson two-point uh, function, but I could search, say, for specifically like strange mesons with a certain type of uh, source. And I can tell it to order by the trajectory number. So this can be very useful um, in terms of either manually searching, just trying to find out what data exists, or say for a, a, an analysis software, you can give it the database directly and it can automatically um, search for the files and then load them, um, removing the human uh, sort of error part of this. Um, and this, uh, is helping towards the sort of findable part of the FAIR principles that uh, sort of the Lattice community is trying to, to move towards. So, of course, how do you actually interface with Hadrons? Um, so there are two interfaces at the moment. Uh, we have sort of C++ API, which is sort of currently the, the recommended um, uh, approach. And there's also an XML input. So... Um, so from the C++ side, you can use all of the, the nice features of, uh, of C++ as a language uh, to help you produce this, um, this, uh, this application. Whereas the XML input is very good for small test jobs where um, you, like, you don't mind writing out uh, each module explicitly. Um, but yeah, so here's just a quick example of how you might uh, create a Meson two-point function um, where you uh, essentially you're filling in the fields as dependencies from previous modules that, or other modules that are run in the job. Um, okay. So of course, all this would be useless if it didn't have functionality that you actually need. So this is all built into the, the modules that are available. Um, and so uh, if you look in the repository, there's a folder called modules, and this, these are um, separated into various categories, or with the prefix M. Um, and to try and avoid this being just a long list of modules that you can, you can use, um, I think we should uh, uh, walk through this, uh, walk through sort of a common Lattice QCD workflow that you might, uh, uh, you might uh, need. And I'll sort of mention uh, other um, related um, modules as we go through. So this is going to be a... Um, an application to create some two and three point meson, uh, the two and three point meson functions. Um, so, of course, the first thing you need whenever you uh, do a lattice simulation is you need a gauge field. So, um, so this is sort of the simplest one you can get. It's unit gauge, um, and so unit gauge and also a random gauge field. These are very useful for testing um, purposes. 
But of course, if you actually want to do any physics, you're going to want to load uh, a gauge field produced by sort of an HMC or something. And so uh, currently, we're, we support loading from the NERSC and OpenQCD uh, configuration formats. Um, and then, of course, uh, some additional modules related to that. Uh, you have the option to uh, fix the gauge and or stout smear um, if, if you want to do that. OK, so then, of course, uh, we're going to want to be doing propagator inversions. So you need a, a fermion action. Uh, so here's an example with a, a domain wall fermion action. And so uh, we see we create this, uh, this structure, this uh, parameter structure. We fill it in a sort of very transparent way. It's very clear what, uh, what uh, each thing is, unlike with, in the functional approach where you just have a list of arguments, where uh, you have to look at the uh, function signature to actually understand what you're putting into this, this function. So here, here the, uh, the actual uh, data members tell you exactly what you're trying to construct. And you see here it uh, depends on the gauge field that we just produced, as well as the, uh, the other action parameters. Uh, and so we sort of create this module. We tell it uh, what type this is. And also we give it some name uh, so it can be tracked through the application. And of course, uh, not everyone wants to do domain wall. Uh, so we also support uh, various Wilson, Wilson Clover, and exp exponentiated Wilson actions. Uh, as well as uh, some various domain wall. Um, so we have scale, domain wall, Mobius, and Zmobius uh, available at the moment. Um, so one, um, one technique that we can use to accelerate our, uh, uh, our, our drag operator inversions is the idea of low mode deflation, where we take the lowest n eigen, uh, eigenvectors of the drag operator, and we can uh, uh, invert the um, the, so the operator onto the source exactly in this sort of subspace. Um, we refer to this uh, collection of eigenvectors and eigenvalues as an eigenpack. And here's an example where you're uh, loading an eigenpack from disk. Um, and then here we create what is known as a guesser, which is the, the object that actually applies this to the source to deflate the source um, in the language of sort of uh, grid. And so, um, yeah, we have this and we also this, uh, here's an example of exact deflation, but we also have support for uh, local coherence uh, compressed def uh, eigenvectors and deflation, which can be used to significantly uh, reduce the, the disk size and the, the I.O. times. So of course, once we have uh, uh, an, uh, an action and a guesser, if you want to use that, we need to create some solvers. So here is just the simple red-black preconditioned uh, conjugate gradient. Uh, taking, of course, the, uh, the action and also the, the guesser. Um, but we also support uh, other types of solver, such as the mixed precision um, red-black CG, which is uh, doing a lot of the sort of heavy lifting in, in my jobs personally. Uh, we also have mixed precision by CG stab, uh, a CG and E solver, and also a Mobius accelerated domain wall fermion solver. Uh, again, if, uh, if domain wall fermion is your action of choice. So now that we have this, we have sort of uh, all of the, the setup um, process complete. Now we need to actually start creating sources to invert on. So here's our example of uh, just a simple point source uh, at the spatial origin and time 16. But uh, of course, there are a variety of sources, uh, other sources that you can use, such as wall, Gaussian, uh, Jacobi smearing. And we have a range of Z2 uh, uh, noise sources. Um, for things like quark loop, um, uh, quark loops. Okay, so once we finally have all that in place, we can actually get to the the uh, uh, sort of the, the meat of the job, which is oper uh, drag operator inversions. So this is just simply uh, just takes a source and a solver, um, and you don't have to care about all of the intermediate objects that have to be created in this process. It's all transparent to the user. Uh, sorry, all opaque to the user. Um, and so this is just an example of a, a gauge propagator from uh, using the, the gauge field created earlier. But we also have support for free propagators and uh, lepton propagators that support uh, the insertion of a uh, A slash photon field um, for QED processes. OK, so um, that's sort of the, the, the very basics. 
something a little bit uh, extra we can do is uh, sequential insertions of various operators. So here we just have an example of uh, inserting a, um, a temporal gamma matrix uh, also with inserting some momentum and at a fixed uh, time of 32 here. Um, so this can be used to, uh, to create your three-point functions. Um, so we have to set up this as a, an additional source and then of course, simply just uh, solve on that, um, just as we did in the previous case. And so uh, what we currently support is uh, sequential versions of local um, sort of bilinear operators with a, a arbitrary gamma structure and momentum. Um, also a local uh, photon field insertion, similar to um, the, in the, um, the case of the solver that I just showed. And also uh, support for conserved excellent axial and partially conserved, conserved vector, partially conserved axial, and uh, conserved A slash uh, insertions, um, which is uh, yeah, heavily used for, for our QED projects. So all of this comes together when we start uh, doing actual contractions. We've produced our, our, um, our propagators. We need to actually contract them. So here's just a simple example of a meson two-point function using uh, some propagators, uh, the strange that we um, haven't showed, but exactly similar to, to the light process. Um, and of course, uh, we support a wide, array, a wide range of uh, possible contractions. So of course, meson and baryon two-point functions, sort of the, the lattice QCD bread and butter. Um, we have quark bilinear uh, quark insertions for three-point functions. Um, we also have uh, support for quark loops, uh, disconnected loops, as well as some, some more specialist modules, um, such as the KL2 decay, including QED, so where photons can attack to the lepton propagator, um, and also K to pi and sigma to proton uh, four quark um, uh, transition um, uh, contractions. Um, and of course, if, uh, if you have a project you'd like to use hadrons for, and uh, isn't currently supported by this, this sort of range of, um, of contractions, you we're, like, we'd very much like to see you um, like tell us about it or implement it yourself and uh, add to this, this list, because this is really where the sort of, um, this is really where we need to, sort of community uh, to, to input, to uh, grow this software, to meet everyone's needs. Okay, so, um, I'll quickly mention here I have a, a, a commented out line. Um, so if we just uncommented this, remove this line, this would save the output of this, this uh, contraction module into a, an HDF5 file, and uh, we could record that in our results database. However, as, um, as contraction codes get very large, sort of, uh, they can reach the point where they have sort of hundreds of thousands of these modules, many of which would be contractions, suddenly, like a project can be producing all, of order millions of files. And, uh, and when using sort of parallel file systems, this can become incredibly slow to access uh, files and uh, folder structures. So really, like, we'd like to cut down on, on the number of files output. And so what we have is this uh, capability of bundling multiple, uh, multiple uh, outputs into one single HDF5 file. So we're localizing similar data into uh, the same file. And this can really take uh, a lot of pressure off of the file system when sort of running analysis. Um, and so uh, the way we handle this is we just uh, have a sort of a normal standard vector and we uh, fill it with the, the names of the modules that uh, produce these outputs. And of course we, uh, we tell it to not output in the, the actual contraction module. This leaves, um, leaves the contraction as um, a dependency that can be accessed by other modules for this one. So we, we fill this, we tell it which modules to, uh, to bundle the data from, and then it simply just uh, combines these into um, groups in the HDF5 uh, output format. Okay. So of course, um, we need to tell Hadrons when we create, date, uh, when we create uh, an output file, how to fill it into a database. So here's an example of how you might construct the sort of structure of this database, um, where you have the, the fields that you want um, 
the, the metadata that you want to add. And then you just simply, in a similar way to creating modules, you just uh, construct this, this um, data structure, and then you s uh, set the result metadata with the name of the, uh, of the module that produced that data. And so as it runs through the, uh, the application, it will automatically be populating this database. And by the end of the job, you can uh, simply just search for the files that you need. And here, here's an example of um, sort of how you might use this database once it's, uh, once it's full. You can simply just use the uh, SQL language um, with a sort of fairly self-explanatory kind of query. Um, uh, and this is an example of a slightly less trivial uh, database than just these ones. This is for the three-point function where it has more, uh, more information. So you can search by, say, um, the separation from the source, uh, the gamma structures, the momentum, and also tell it to uh, order it by trajectory. So this is great for uh, seeing what data exists and also um, piping this directly into your analysis software. Um, all major software, uh, like all, all major languages, have support for uh, SQLite um, uh, databases in some library or another. Um, and so, yeah, really, this uh, if you use this approach, then gone are the days of searching through a cryptic file structure to find something, or if you're unlucky, find nothing. Um, this gives you direct high level access to the data in a very sort of findable way. Okay, so um, some other features, that, since that was a, a fairly simple uh, workflow. Um, we heard in the previous talk all about uh, distillation from uh, Felix, and this is fully implemented in hadrons. Um, so the sort of generation of uh, Laplacian eigenvectors, perambulators, meson fields, and there's also a, a dedicated contraction code uh, in, in hadrons. Um, so you can do the, the full um, distillation workflow uh, with the software, and uh, yeah, just some examples from Felix's slide of the things you can uh, create with this, and um, sort of some other modules that uh, are, are available uh, include sort of non uh, tools for non-perturbative non renormalization, um, the relativistic heavy quark action, um, a various selection of uh, A2A utilities. Um, there is Lanchos solvers for the uh, Laplacian eigenvectors and also uh, eigenvectors of the Dirac operator, um, including um, with uh, local coherence com uh, compression. And also there's a, a selection of tools for non-QCD people who like to do uh, scalar theories and scalar plus gauge theories. Um, although personally I have no experience with that, so, uh, <laughs> but uh, feel free to, to look into the, um, the repository and see what tools are, are available there. So, uh, so yeah, here's just a quick list of, um, of projects that are either current or uh, complete that have used hadrons in production. Um, this is uh, just a selection from sort of the local uh, Edinburgh Southampton group, but uh, see here, there's you can do all sorts of like a wide array array of, uh, of observables, such as uh, isosprint breaking corrections to uh, KL2, um, some uh, sort of rare K K on and uh, uh, hyperon decays. Um, of course, we saw from uh, Nelson earlier and at the last conference about the K star and row resonances using distillation. Um, and there's also projects uh, uh, about the uh, exclusive and inclusive uh, D decays. Um, and so all of this can be done using the, the tools currently available. And uh, we'd love to see your project on this list. Um, uh, so yeah, feel free to, uh, to use the software and uh, contribute if uh, it doesn't quite meet your needs yet. Um, I'll quickly uh, say that um, we're uh, planning to have a Hadron's version two sometime in the coming academic year, probably late, later in the academic year, where we want to uh, improve both the internals and also add new features. Um, so some uh, rough ideas include sort of sub-module blocks where you take a, a collection of, of modules and treat them as one module as far as the scheduler is concerned, so keep them uh, localized together. Um, this can really help when there's large numbers of modules that you know need to be executed uh, 
or can be executed very close together in time. Um, we'd like to have a, a JSON interface since the XML can be uh, uh, a little bit painful to write sometimes. And we'd also like to include default parameters, um, which can really cut down on the, the number of things you, you have to uh, enter when you don't care about them. Um, we'd also very much like to have a Python interface. So C++ as a compiled language is not always the tool that you want, whereas Python uh, being um, an interpreted language can be much quicker to, uh, um, to make these developments. So uh, we'd like to work towards that. And also support for a split grid where you can take uh, a subsection of your MPI ranks and do computations, uh, thank you, computations uh, locally on that, uh, that small grid um, for potentially better performance um, while having sort of the, the memory support of the, the, the full uh, set of nodes. Um, something that uh, we currently make no promises about, but something we're really thinking about is um, the uh, idea of having a graph, graph, uh, graphical user interface. So uh, by directly um, creating these modules in this graph structure yourself, rather than just um, telling the like uh, C++ or some other interface what the connections are, you can actually, we would like to have it so that you could uh, actively draw these, these connections in a visual way. Um, but that is a, quite a large project. Um, and really, we want this to be useful to the community. So um, if there are features that you think are missing and that you would like, please come and talk to me or uh, sort of uh, well, me or anyone uh, sort of within uh, the, the contributor group. And uh, just let us know what you'd like, and we can see about implementing it. Or if you are feeling brave, you can uh, come and contribute yourself and join the, the community. Um, uh, so I'm a little bit uh, ahead of schedule, but um, as it's the last last talk of the day, you're probably not uh, <laughs> too too uh, bothered about that. But um, so just uh, just in conclusion, so hadrons is uh, sort of allowing us to utilize the performance of grid, but in the sort of uh, and the cross-platform capabilities, but with this sort of flow-based, uh, I would argue, more intuitive design model for uh, producing contraction codes. Um, it provides us with the schedule, uh, scheduling to minimize resources and also resource monitoring, um, which can be very helpful for, um, for managing our jobs, especially as they get larger and larger. Um, it supports results databases to help uh, sort of access the data in a very uh, findable way. Um, there is much, hopefully much more to come in Hadrons 2.0. Many improvements, so please let us know. And uh, yeah, we welcome your contributions to the software. Um, and with that, I'll end. Thank you very much.